Uh, the message that I'd like to share with you this morning is rooted in my childhood experience with Star Wars. Now, some of you lived through that time. I was born in 1968, so I was nine years old when Star Wars came out on May 25th of 1977. And how many of you remember, remember one of the big news items was this kind of thing? <laughs> Wasn't even so much like what the movie was about or anything. It was more about like the lines, the endless lines, the lines after. I think once I waited for like an hour and a half or two hours just to get into the big Woodfield screen that they used to have there to see Star Wars for the fifth time or whatever it was. This is kind of evocative of disco. Do you remember disco? I'm glad that was short-lived. Not a big disco fan. This was the year in January of 1977 that Alex Haley's Roots was made into a TV miniseries. This was the year that Elvis died. And this was kind of shocking when I put this image on there. You can't see it on the screen, but it says that he was 42 years old. Now, I'm 47, and I remember when he died, um, thinking, wow, you know, he's had a good career and all that. He was only 42 years old. That doesn't seem possible. This was the year that the very first home personal computer came out, this Commodore 2001 series, PET, I forget what that stands for. That's what it looked like. Young people, take note. You take about a million of those and roll it into your iPhone and that's what you get. <clears throat> and this was the year that the Atari 2600 came out. This was, this, was like, this was like a sibling to me. I have a brother and a sister, but I played this thing so many, day after day, just like Tim plays his Wii. This, oh, I had so many games. I just love playing that game system over and over again. But thinking about all this Star Wars hubbub going on right now and thinking about how important it is for our culture, it really made me think about how much of an impact Star Wars has had on our religious culture in the United States and, and indeed around the world. Now here you can see an artist's rendering of uh, Yoda as a preacher preaching from some sacred text to a bunch of, you got a couple Jawas and a Greedo and Boba Fett and R2-D2, <laughs> all these Star Wars characters are there, and they're in a sanctuary setting, and I don't know if you can tell, but that's the Millennium Falcon, so I have no idea what story he's talking about, but um, this, I really think, is, this picture really embodies for us the effect that Star Wars has had on the religious culture of the United States. Now, this is a quote from George Lucas, I think, in an interview that he gave to The New Yorker, I believe in 2000. He said, I wanted Star Wars to be a traditional moral study, to have some sort of palpable precepts in it that children could understand. There's always a lesson to be learned. Where do these lessons come from? Traditionally, we get them from church, family, art, and in the modern world, we get them from the media, from the movies. And it's probably not too much of an understatement to say that Star Wars and George Lucas really transformed the relationship between movies and the popular culture and indeed the religious culture of the United States, if not the world. Now here's... a. Uh, a famous quote from Han Solo. Now, you know Han Solo is kind of this renegade, uh, you know, he's a pirate, and oh, he's also kind of like a, a middleman when it comes to, you know, trading goods and this kind of thing, and he's just in it for himself. And he doesn't really believe in all this religious stuff, and at one point he says, hokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side, kid, he says to Luke Skywalker. So what might our response be to that? I find your lack of faith disturbing. Remember this one in the first movie? <clears throat> Where this guy, I forget what his name is, but he has the same approach to the religion of the Force. And Darth Vader's going to have none of that. And then he just starts strangling the guy with the Force. I find your lack of faith disturbing. So should we have that kind of response to people that feel this way, perhaps, about Jesus and Christianity? And there's a lot of them. Do we think this way? Maybe a little bit. We might think, well, that's kind of disturbing that people don't believe in God or maybe they worship a different God. 
Here's our beloved Yoda. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. So here we're getting a little bit deeper into the message of Star Wars that is really philosophical and it's very Eastern oriented and very kind of Buddhist. This concept of the inner strength is what keeps us going and is the thing, is the desired outcome of a religious faith. And here's one of my favorite memes Garrison Keeler. Do you know Garrison Keeler? A oh, famous uh, writer and public radio storyteller um, for the Lake Wobegon and his uh, radio show Prairie Home Companion. And he is uh, an atheist, by the way, but he sings a lot of gospel songs in his radio program, and he's very deeply religious, but he is an atheist. And he had this meme, <laughs> and somebody took Obi-Wan Kenobi and put a United Methodist stole around him. You know you are a Methodist when someone says, may the force be with you, and you respond, and also with you. <laughs> this... I, this, I think, is maybe where a lot of Christians are, not just United Methodists, but, you know, it's very appropriate that we are called Methodists. Remember, we're called Methodists because when John Wesley and his brother Charles Wesley and their friends met at Oxford in their holy club to learn how to be more righteous and to read the Bible every day and to pray a certain way and to do everything very methodically, their detractors said, oh, you're just a bunch of Methodists because they did everything very methodically and they were very pietistic. They really sought after holiness. And they said, okay, fine. You want to call us Methodists? Then we're Methodists. That's fine. And that's how we got our name because our forefathers in our tradition really wanted to be holy. They really wanted to study the scriptures. They really wanted to pray regularly. They were much more than creatures of habit. Now, this leads me to some conclusions that I think the Star Wars uh, legacy has had upon our religious culture, and that is summed up by some uh, Christian sociologists about 10 years ago on reflecting on a national youth and religion study that had interviewed 3,400 teenagers, 13 to 17 years old, and then the same teenagers three years later and they found that these teenagers believed uh, Christianity was about these five main points. That was kind of like almost Christian, as John Wesley might call it, but not really quite historical Christianity that we're familiar with. And the first one of these precepts is that these teenagers said, well, you know, we believe that God, there is a God who exists and created and orders the world and watches over life on earth. God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible. The central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. God is not involved in my life except when I need God to resolve a problem. And fifth, good people go to heaven when they die. So these were the five characteristics of this almost Christianity that they called it. It's very similar to what we might read about in the Gospels or think of as traditional Christianity, but there's no really, there's no concept of sin and redemption and forgiveness and salvation in that sense. And it's kind of odd because I think these five points really line up very well with what we learn from Star Wars. Oh, those, the bells go off 15 minutes before the 11 o'clock service. I wish I had remembered that. So Obi-Wan Kenobi, he says, the force is an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxies together. I can turn it off. Oh, you got it? Thank you. <laughs> Remote control. Didn't have that in 1977. A Jedi uses the force for knowledge and defense, never for attack. So basically, the religion of Star Wars says, well, God wants you, or the force, or whatever, the supernatural wants you to be good and treat other people with respect. Don't attack them. 
To be Jedi is to face the truth and choose. Give off light or darkness, Padawan. Be a candle or the night, Padawan, but choose. Yoda says this, I think, in episode three to one of the young Padawan Jedi, um, not to Anakin, to somebody else. In other words, it's up to you to choose. Are you going to be happy or not? Or are you going to choose to go down the dark side, as they might say in Star Wars? God is not involved in my life except when I need God to resolve a problem. What's the biggest problem in the first Star Wars movie? The Death Star. And what's the climactic moment? When Ben Kenobi talks to Luke and says, use the Force, Luke. So this is this concept that well, God or the force or the supernatural or whatever is there when you need it. The rest of the time, eh, you know, the force just carries on. And, but when you really need the force to blow up the Death Star, for example, use the force. And finally, this one I had a, a little struggle with to do the parallelism. But here the spirit of Qui-Gon Jinn says... All energy from the living force, from all things that, we, that have ever lived, feeds into the cosmic force, building everything. So this is not really a Christian idea. This is more of an Eastern, perhaps a Hindu idea, that all life is connected. And then when, when death happens, there's a regeneration of life, perhaps the reincarnation. Now, this is kind of the religion that I think I inherited from Star Wars and even from the church somewhat. And as this study revealed 10 years ago, that most teenagers are learning a very similar kind of Christianity, um, whether it's from church or from the culture. Now, think about the stories that we heard this morning with Samuel and Jesus. Uh, The historian Josephus in the first century said that Samuel was probably 12 years old when he was called by God. But Samuel was actually much younger when his mother gave him up to be with the elders, to be raised in this religious community, to be trained in the ways of the priesthood. He was probably about three years old because the text says after he was weaned, which was about three years old. So Hannah gave up Samuel very early And this is alluded to in the passage that we heard this morning. His mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. So this implies that Samuel was in training, just like those little young Padawans in the early episodes. They were training to be Jedis. So Samuel was in training. In fact, we say that Samuel was the last of the judges and the first of the prophets. So he was there from a very early age, and they visited him yearly. So he grew up in this religious community. And then he was about 12 years old when he had this calling from God, and then, of course, later anointed Saul as the first king of Israel. Similarly, Jesus was 12 years old when he was taken with his family to Jerusalem. And then what happens? This thing that is so completely foreign to us, they forget Jesus. Now, some of you are pretty close to being 12 years old. Tim's 10 years old. Um, I can't imagine leaving Tim behind in some cathedral in downtown Chicago and then not knowing for like two days, you know, oh, we forgot Tim. How could they do this? Because they were traveling in probably a big band of extended family, and they just assumed when they're moving that the whole family is moving with them. But Jesus was there doing his father's business. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. So I think there are three primary things that are going on here in the story of Samuel and Jesus, which are very similar. If you read the beginning of Luke and read the beginning of 1 Samuel, you'll see very, there are very many parallels. Hannah's prayer is mirrored by the Magnificat, Mary's prayer, after she gets the news um, that she's going to bear uh, the Christ child. 
In the Jewish Publication Society translation, it says of verse 26 that we heard this morning, young Samuel, meanwhile, grew in esteem and favor both with God and with men. And the last verse we heard from Luke, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. So back then, this was the role of the religious community. This is what the religious community was providing for Samuel and for Jesus. And I would argue that this is what we're doing too. That we're not so much teaching very specific knowledge about the Bible or memorizing the Bible as an end in itself, but hopefully we are rather preparing our young people to be people of character, to be people that have the character required to follow God And these are the three things I think that we see in the text that we heard this morning. That we're raising our children so that they can have divine and social esteem or respect and self-respect. And this gives them purpose. Because without that base level sense of self-respect and general respect within the community, it's hard to have a sense of purpose in your life. And then also, wisdom that is, fear of the Lord, as the Psalms call it. Having wisdom and fear of the Lord, or we might say humility, enables us to practice the things of faith. Because if we don't have humility, then we have no need. And why should I serve others if I don't have humility? I have everything that I need within myself. And finally, divine favor, or what we would call grace as Christians. And this is the thing that really enables us, God's power, his unconditional love, to empower us to participate beyond our religious community. Now here we can see uh, from Psalm 139, the psalmist says, For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This is that first level of training that we give our young people. All the young people that go through Sunday school here, all the youth that come through, all the youth programs and ministries and go on mission trips, go through confirmation, this is a very basic level thing that we're giving them. We're teaching them that they are made by God and because they are made by God, they should have self-respect and respect for other people. And then therefore, they can have purpose. From Proverbs, Chapter 9, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in understanding. Wisdom will multiply your days and add years to your life. If you become wise, you will be the one to benefit. If you scorn wisdom, you will be the one to suffer. So again, this, I think, is linked, the wisdom is linked to the concept of humility. And here we see one of the famous quotes from C.S. Lewis. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, because you have self-respect and purpose. It's thinking of yourself less. This really captures the essence, I think, of what we're trying to instill in our children, too, through service, the mission trips, all of the stuff that we do here. They have the basic self-respect and the sense of purpose, and then they learn that it's not just about them. And then finally, we're giving them the power and the blessing of grace from James. But he gives us more grace even after we sin. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So with these three basic things instilled in our young people, they can have the power to go out there and live the Christian life. But is it just about making binary decisions of what to do and what not to do? Or is living the Christian life more about being who God called you to be, being a person of service, being a person of self-respect and purpose, being a person who does fear the Lord and has humility, being someone who sees the grace of God, the unconditional love that God has given you, as empowering you, to live in service for others? Or is it more about what Star Wars would teach you about, choosing the dark side or choosing the light side? 
I think most of us would agree that's important, but life is really a lot more gray than that message of Star Wars. And if we do go down that dark side, there's still hope. This is the thing I like about Star Wars, is that even the person who seems the most far gone, Darth Vader, even he can repent and turn around his life. And here he is in episode 6, taking his master, the emperor, and throwing him off that, whatever you call it, the big catwalk thing. So even he can defeat evil. Even there's still enough goodness in him that even he can turn to that goodness or what we would call God. So I want to ask you this morning, when you think about where you've come from as a young person or where you are now if you're a young person, what you're learning in this community, what does this community mean to you? Are we teaching you more than this? Hopefully you're getting this on some level, but you should be getting this from your parents, I would think at least. What are we getting from this community? What do we look forward to? How does this community mold us? What are some of the things that we do? This should look familiar to you. That's a picture of where we're sitting right now from the balcony. Do you see this community in this kind of way? In small groups? Or maybe even this kind of way? Just sitting quietly by yourself with a cup of coffee or hot chocolate and reading your Bible? Or maybe just something as simple as this? Just sitting one by one whether it's here in the church building or out at Panera or at home, visiting people who are lonely or just even within your family, just spending some quiet time one-on-one. That's this church. And hopefully you would see this church too is more than just the teaching or just the programs. That we're answering the call of Jesus in Matthew 25. When he says, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. We had mention of that earlier this morning. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Here are some Syrian refugees in a Catholic cathedral in Europe. I was in prison and you visited me. That Confirmation Sunday is a celebration of the fact that you're on a journey. Much like this scene at the end of the first Star Wars movie is a celebration of the journey that they're on. Because it didn't end here. This was just a one-time celebration. This is a very important part of church, but this is not the end-all and be-all of our community. And so we might find ourselves this morning asking ourselves, how can we take the messages of the culture, perhaps even of Star Wars, and take them and turn them deeper and plow their richer soil in the story of Christianity? Where can we find the parallel so that we can learn to use these as connection points with the culture that is so deeply embedded in this mythology of Star Wars and and other mythologies. Maybe we could be more like Ben Kenobi when he lays his life down to save his friends. Just like Jesus said, those who try to make their life secure will lose it, but those who lose their life will keep it. Amen.